Hi, welcome to the Pretty Intense Podcast. On the show today is Dr. Joe Dispenza, who really needs no introduction. He is the most amazing human at getting people to accept the idea of getting beyond their body. He really helps people with that transition. He has retreats, he has books, um, he's on lots of podcasts and does lots of interviews so that you can help understand his work. But let me tell you from someone who's been to retreats of his and his week long, he really helps you understand the power of meditation and the power of creating and that you are a creator and you're creating your reality every day by what you put your point of attention on. We go unconscious when we start to use the mind and when we're conscious when we're allowing for the flow of things to happen and getting out of that thinking mind, which only regurgitates and puts you in the same patterns that you've already been in over and over and over again, probably since you were a kid. Super deep dive, great conversation about creating in 5D, the power of meditation, knowing versus believing, and where the magic sauce is in manifesting and creating the rea reality that you want, and then essentially his mission and what he hopes to accomplish. So enjoy the show please hit subscribe, hit the bell for notifications when a new episode comes out. I just truly enjoy doing this show. Let me hear your thoughts in the comments and have a great day. I remember you talking about that, like magic is supposed to be normal. It's a side effect. It's really the side effect. I mean, the, I expect that when I meditate, I, I don't do it for any other reason that really to, to shorten the distance between the thought of what I want and the experience of having it. That's the, that's the grace. That's the fun. What's when the magic get, sauce? Yes, well, the magic sauce is you and me. I mean, that's it. It's just us. We have all the resources. We just got to do it. That's it. I felt like the magic sauce from a practical standpoint was embodying the feeling, having accomplished it. Like it's one yeah. thing to know why you want it. And it's another thing to, for those like, if, so catch up people for a second since we're on this topic. Um <clears throat> you did a manifestation technique where we thought about what we wanted and it could be anything, right? It could be a shopping trip. It could be a car. It could be a whatever, any, anything that you want to manifest and then sort of represent that with a letter. And then on, you know, one side of the letter, you write down three, four, five reasons why. And then on the other side, you write down three or four, five reasons or elevated emotions having accomplished it. And mm -hmm. so then we went into the meditation and we did it. And anyway, two hours later, it happened and somebody goes, oh, there's a trip to Egypt in February if you want to go. And so, boom, here we are now. So that to me feels like what the magic sauce is. Is that right? Or Well, um, let's talk about it. I think that we're, we've been hypnotized and conditioned into believing that, you know, we have to do something in order to have an experience in three dimensional reality. And this is the plane of demonstration. So when we have the experience, the end product of an experience is an emotion, right? So that's the payoff when you, when you have your abundance, when you have your new relationship, when you have your new career, you, you, you live in separation from the emotion until the experience occurs. And then when the experience occurs, it takes away the lack or separation of not having it. Nothing wrong with that. That's the rules of three dimensional reality. And you can get really good at it. You know, you could go to school, you can make the right choices, you can learn from your mistakes, you can be um, uh, trained to get better at it, and you can develop skills and, and you can, you know, you can accumulate resources and, and it can get easier for you. But in the quantum, if you're creating from the field instead of from matter, which is a broad conversation, you have to feel it uh, in order to experience it. Uh, mm. uh, and so that's, uh, that's kind of a reversal because most people will say, well, I'm not going to feel gratitude until my healing actually happens. Well, it turns out that you got to feel gratitude in order for the healing to happen. <laughs> and our data so shows that over and over again. So your body is uh, so objective that mm. when you feel the emotion before the experience, it doesn't know the difference between the real life experience that's creating that emotion and the emotion that you're fabricating by thought alone. The body's actually believing it's living in a new environment, a new uh, uh, condition. So it turns out it requires, if, a, if you're looking at a secret sauce, we've kind of whittled it down to a formula and it requires a clear intention and that is a vision of what you want to have happen. And that is mm -hmm. selecting a new possibility, an unknown, 
that you would like to experience. Okay, so what does that require? That requires your brain being really coherent. So we've isolated the process of being able to make your brain work better. And I, I talked to the brain scientists a few times and I said, tell me what percentage of people uh, that immerse themselves in an event for seven days, what percentage of those people do their, uh, do their brains get better? These, they said 100%. 100%. So we know that you can make your brain work better if you learn that formula. Okay, so now we have a clear intention, but that's only one element. There is another element that is the handmaiden to that, and that is an elevated emotion. Now, elevated emotion, I'm talking about, you can, so many people feel with every single body part, except their heart. I mean, that's just kind of a weird thing that we do as human beings. Well, you protect that, you know, it's uh, you being vulnerable in the jungle is means you're, you're more likely to be taken advantage of, you know, and you get bruised or injured in your life. Uh, you kind of learn from that and you got to, you get, you, you, you protect it, right? So in the creative process, the heart is the creative center. We have compelling data to show that once you open that heart of yours and it starts beating in a rhythm and a coherence, it actually informs the brain uh, it's safe to create. It actually tells the brain to mm-hmm. get creative and brain waves change. Mm-hmm. And so when you combine that coherent heart and elevated emotion and you start feeling the emotions before the experience, the heart actually produces an external magnetic field. Well, now you got a Wi-Fi signal and that field could actually resonate with a coherent brain, the intent. And the thought is the electrical charge that sends the signal out. It's the directive. And the elevated emotion, that, that feeling is a magnetic charge. And we've got enough information to show that the heart's the magnet. So you're going to draw the experience to you with your heart. So when there's a kind of match in frequency between some potential in the quantum field mm-hmm. and what you would like to experience, and you keep tuning in to that potential, and you're you're actually creating from the field instead of from matter the rules change yeah yeah. now you don't have to go anywhere Mm. to get what you want somehow the experience finds you and it comes in unexpected and surprising ways to prove to you that you're actually a creator in your life and so true when that occurs then it's no longer like i have to meditate it's actually like i'm not going to stop doing this because i don't (laughs) want the magic to end and so that's what I'm really super proud about in our community. We're, we're doers, you know, we, we, we do the work, you know, not because we have to, or to please God or do the right thing or not feel guilty or, uh, we do it because we don't want the magic to end mm. in all those synchronicities, all those mm. coincidences, all those opportunities that start appearing in our life to prove to us what I did inside of me is somehow producing some effect outside of me. And if I can correlate what I did inside with me with those synchronicities, those opportunities that are happening outside of me, I'm gonna pay attention to what I'm doing and do it again. And my belief in what's possible actually broadens. Mm -hmm. And oh gosh, I've been studying people in the last uh, uh, six months or so because my, my belief about what's possible has actually changed in witnessing so many people's transformations. I never thought I would see multiple, uh, uh, multiple sclerosis or muscular dystrophy or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or blindness or um, uh, paralysis uh, a change uh, in, in seven days. I mean, this is kind of crazy stuff that we're witnessing. And I, I, I wow. listen to the testimonials of these people and I talk to them and what they change uh, is their doubt in what's possible. And, and, and we were kind of talking about this before we started. Uh, it's so relevant for all of us because some people think they do the meditation. If I do this meditation, I'll heal. And right. I, when I listened really closely to those people and some of them did their meditations two and three times a day. Why? Because no chemo, <laughs> no drug, no surgery, no diet, no exercise was actually changing their health at all. And nothing changes in our life until we change yeah so they were doing their meditation two and three times a day not because they thought if i meditate more and try harder it's going to work they defaulted back to the doubt that it was possible now when you're when you respond and react to someone or something in your life and you get back into the familiar feeling of yourself you're going to believe in your past more than you're going to believe in your future 
Mm. So they did the meditation to change their state. They got that clear intention back again. They felt their elevated emotion. When they felt the elevated emotion, they actually believed in their future again because they could feel they could feel connected to it. So yeah. they were doing their meditations two and three times a day, not to do it more so they could heal, but they defaulted back to their doubt and they had to go back and change their belief. And so many of them now, after their moment, um, uh, God, we have so much, so many great testimonials, and, and I listen really closely. They say, now I have no doubt, like no doubt. There was a guy in London that came to our event in August with muscular dystrophy, a really rare form of Baker's or Slim Garden's mu muscular dystrophy. It's progressive, uh, that, that you look at it on the internet anywhere, it'll say there is no cure for it. He came in a wheelchair, he walked out of that event. He walked, he was walking. He, they just sent me a video of him this week, walking down the street in India, just strolling down the street. Like, like you, you, I don't know if people really understand like the magnitude of that, that is going so against convention. It's such an unusual thing to witness. I watched that video 50 times in the beginning over and over again, because I just had to say, wow, this is unbelievable. I got to really remember what's possible uh, as human beings. And it is really changing our belief uh, from a state of doubt, like and doubt is the emotion that keeps us connected to believing in the past. And then feeling the elevated emotion kept, causes us to believe more in the future. And it only takes that image of the future and the emotion, the thought and the feeling, the stimulus and response where you start conditioning the body into the mind or the emotion of that future. and. And he's he's in a new body. He's in a new life. He's in a wow. whole new future. Wow. In, in just an instant. Yeah. Wow. This brings up something that I was curious about, which is the difference between believing and knowing. Yeah. Yeah. And that there is still possibly a resonance of not believing if you need to say, I believe. Mm -hmm. And that what I'm maybe hearing is that there's some transition that happens as they go through this process where they just know. So is there a difference between those two? Some people do the work and when they finish their meditation, they believe less in their future because they actually never overcame themselves. They never overcame that emotion, right? And there's a story that's connected to that emotion because emotions are residue yeah. chemically of the past. <laughs> there's others who get up who believe more in their future uh, when they finish their meditation and that's the way it should be because they change their state. They change their yeah. state of being. So so this is a great conversation because I've been really exploring this in my own in my own journey. Uh. Um, belief uh, is like pregnancy, like either you are or you're not. I mean, there's no in between. Uh, when people have a profound experience in their meditation, where something switches, where they have some inward moment that somehow everything aligns, their brain, mm -hmm. their body, everything lines up, that kind of, that kind of alignment is an absolute knowingness. There is a knowingness that takes place. And I listened to so many of them in the last few months say, I know I'm going to heal. We just were in Niagara Falls. Yeah. We did a big event there and some physician, 41 years in medicine uh, with a big spinal cord tumor. He had the, he had the tumor removed and uh, they put a stint in there and he was paralyzed for the last 10 years and he's walking around. What he talked about more than anything else I, he was, I, I was right there with him in the audience. He could, he could not stop talking about the amount of love that he was feeling. He said he had, he had never felt that amount of love in his life. Now, mm. I had to force him into saying, and, and what else? So well, how did that affect your body? Oh, yeah, I came in a wheelchair. Now I can yeah. walk around a lot better. And I have no doubt. I know now. I know. I'm going to heal. I know it. This is, and that's like, that is the, that is what seals the belief into a complete uh, uh, finality. And so he's not trying to believe. <laughs> he, he knows, he exactly. knows that he knows. And, and there's and, no effort. Yeah, exactly. So, so many times people during their meditation have an inward event 
that has such a profound uh, experience for them that they realize that inward event produces a feeling of love or some connection that's transcend transcendent of language mm -hmm. where they where they it, it the amount of love or the amount of uh, joy or the amount of bliss or ecstasy that they feel from that moment is a really important moment of reckoning because they realize it's not coming from anybody out there. It's not yeah. coming from the relationship. It's not coming from the wardrobe. It's not coming from their diet. It's not coming from their sports car. It's not coming from Netflix. It's not coming from social media. This is a really profound feeling that they never ever felt before. Yeah. That moment of connection somehow causes a biological upgrade in the body. And in that moment, there's a alignment to a future where they already know, and it's not like they're trying to know. It's the side effect of some inward event, and and now they live their life in a state of knowing, and that's so much better than doubt, you know, or disbelief. Yeah. I went to your retreat at the end of 2020, and there's a lot of talk about 3D versus 5D creation, yeah. and what this sounds like to me, or what I, maybe I'm asking is when you get to that point of having that knowing or feeling something so deeply and having that coherence resonance in the body are you connecting now to the simultaneous timelines in the quantum field of that reality actually happening that you could feel it like so i'm asking that and i'm asking I get, and I'm saying I would get overwhelmed with the idea of parallel timelines and being able to have time collapse into everything happening simultaneously. So I just want to say that I'm, it confuses my head. I can't see it clearly. It doesn't make mm -hmm. sense to me, but I trust in it. Mm -hmm. So is yeah. that kind of what's happening? And I really want to talk about creating in 5D because I think that's where we're at. Okay, so I'm going to have to unpack that a little bit. I, th I think this is a, a wow. great conversation. Okay. Um, and for the, for the audience, I think we just got to lay down a little foundation so we don't lose Perfect. anybody, right? Perfect. So we live in a 3D, three-dimensional reality. Everything that we look at, an object, a person, anything that's physical or material has height and depth and width. And we can pick things up, right? And we can say, well, that's an object and I have a, I'm a, I have a body. And now that I have a body and I'm aware, I'm a consciousness, then I'm local in space and time. And, and in this reality of three-dimensional reality, there's an infinite amount of space. Space is eternal. Space is actually accelerating right now. Yeah. It's no longer expanding. It's accelerating. Okay. So we know that space is eternal. And the way we experience time in three-dimensional reality is we have to go from one point of awareness, like I'm stand, sitting here, and if I want to go to my garden, I put my attention on another point of awareness, that's my other point of consciousness. Now, if I want to have the experience of getting to my garden or picking a piece of uh, fruit off my uh, tree, I have to move my body through space, and when I move from one point of awareness to the other point of awareness, that, that interval is called time. So everything in three-dimensional reality takes time to create you mm -hmm. you you experience separation i'm here and you're there and everything's separate from me and so our senses plug us into three-dimensional reality think about this if you weren't if you were lost all your senses you weren't seeing you weren't hearing you weren't smelling you weren't tasting you couldn't feel with your body you would have no experience of three-dimensional reality and yet you would be conscious and aware but you would have no interaction with anything physical or material. Okay, that mm -hmm. makes sense. All right, so then the way we get about creating our future is that we say, okay, I wanna have this new house, I wanna have a dog, I wanna have a new relationship, uh, I wanna live in this place. And what the brain automatically does based on its experience of itself up until that point, remember the brain is a record of the past, right. it's, it's a memory bank of everything you've learned and experienced. So the brain says, okay, let me predict how this is going to happen. <laughs> I got to take on a second job. Okay, I got to start saving my beans. Uh, I got to make better choices. Um, uh, I may actually uh, try to figure out a way to invest better. You know, you're gonna, and, and your brain says, okay, I'm gonna have that life in two years if I do, if I, if I, if I get my behaviors to match my intentions and I keep making the same choices, I'm gonna run into that exper experience. Okay, so let's think about it. The same thing occurs. There's me here, Joe Dispenza. I'm aware that I'm local in space and time. Mm -hmm. And then where's my future? 
way out there. My brain is forecasting it way out in the future based on what I've done in the past or what I know about myself in the past. Okay. So now I got to go from this point to that point and I'm separate from that experience. So yeah. I'm going to spend my entire life mm. waiting for that experience to happen to take away the lack or separation from, from having it. Mm -hmm. So the interval between the thought of what I want and the experience of having it is called time, cause and effect, right? Mm -hmm. So then, as we said earlier, when you have the experience, you get the house, you know, and it, you pay it off and it takes 30 years, you know, you're, you're too old to enjoy it. You're going to sell it anyway. You know, you, you're, everything's, you know, you've, you've, it's, everything's taken a lot of time yep. and a lot of energy. Yep. And it takes a lot of time and energy to move your body through space and time and then throw in the hormones of stress. And stress is when you can't predict something, when you have the perception something's going to get worse or you're going to lose control of something in your life. You switch on that pretty primitive system where you're going to mobilize all your energy. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that those very chemicals actually heighten the senses. And we become more of a materialist and we narrow our focus on everything physical and material. Why? Because the alert system through adrenaline or epinephrine, norepinephrine is saying, pay attention to the danger. Mm -hmm. So if there's something rustling in the bushes and it's nighttime, you're going to freeze, you're going to narrow your focus and you're going to look for something physical or material, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's look at the human being over generations untold. I mean, just 300 years ago, 200 years ago, being a human being wasn't easy. Right. I mean, a starvation, a disease, um, predator. I mean, all kinds of things were, were, were is a strong reality. So we spent a lot of time living in survival and living in survival over generations causes us to only see the material right. world because that's relevant. You're not going to really, really wasn't that long ago. Yeah. In and the it's not things. Yeah. And so why would you look for energy or frequency or the quantum or the immaterial right. when everything material is vital when you're living in survival? So right. keep that survival system switched on for an extended period of time. The arousal of those hormones causes you to feel more like your body. <laughs> you have more attention on your body because if T-Rex is chasing you, <laughs> uh, you better be thinking about your body. Okay. And when you're under stress and you're in survival, your attention is on the environment. Why? Because that's where the danger is. So, so now what's your environment made of? Objects, things, places, bodies, people, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. it's very material. Okay. So Safety. now, right. The arousal causes us to pay more attention to the outer world and less attention to our inner world. And this rush of chemicals causes us to become very preoccupied with trying to make that feeling of survival and stress go away. So time becomes very relevant as well. Mm -hmm. So now your body is where you put your attention. Your environment is where you put your attention and your attention is on time. Well, it turns out to change is actually to be greater than your body, to be greater mm -hmm. than your environment and be greater than time. So if people are spending the majority of their life with the emergency mm -hmm. system switched on, it's not a time to create. It's not oh a time God. to learn. It's not a time to go within. It's not a time to meditate. It goes against the survival gene that says you will be prey. It's not a time to open your heart. It's not a time to commune. Oh. It's not even a time to eat. Look at the last and, few years. Mm. Yeah. So people spend the majority of their time shutting. Uh, uh, let me say it another way. So then, so then when a person is living in survival and they're trying to control and predict and change everything that's going on in their life, every person that they know, every object or thing that they own, every place that they know or have lived or go to, and everything they've experienced in their past, they're going to try to predict in their future. So now the arousal of stress hormones causes the brain to fire out of order because every person, every object, everything has a different neurological network in the brain. Now the brain is firing incoherently. And when it's firing incoherently, we're incoherent. At the same time, you're sitting in a Zoom meeting and it's not T-Rex, it's your coworker. And you're actually producing the same chemicals as if you're being chased by T-Rex, but you don't, you're not running. You're not fighting. You're not hiding. You're doing sitting there and those, those chemicals are running through the body and the heart is actually pumping really hard because it's turned on and it's got to run, fight or hide. And you're sitting there and the heart is actually pumping against the closed system and the heart starts to become incoherent. And when incoherence takes place in the heart, the interference of, of waves actually causes energy to drop in the heart. So now you have no energy in the heart, you have no energy in the brain, and now the person is living in their animal self, in that animal nature, right? And so they're waiting 
for something to change in their outer world. They're waiting for something to change in their outer world to take away this feeling of fear or anxiety or frustration or impatience or resentment or pain or suffering or guilt or shame. And they're living by that emotional state and they would rather cling to those memories and those emotions because at least it's the known, right? And it's survival. Why? Because in survival, the unknown, you better run from the unknown. There's better chances of survival. So nobody takes a chance, right? Okay, so, so then back to the 3D world then. The Newtonian world, the classical world of quantum physics is all about, uh, uh, Newtonian physics is all about the predictable, right? And we can shoot a rocket to the moon if we know the distance and the speed of the rocket. We can determine the time it's going to take to get there. So this three-dimensional reality is all about predictions, right? Okay, well, you can get what you want, but you got to work really hard and it's going to take a lot of time and energy. You can develop the skills to get it. Okay, now, so is there possibly another way to do it? I mean, okay, let's look at another way. Is there another way to actually do it in a shorter amount of time, to shorten the distance between the thought of what you want and the experience of having it, between the cause and the effect? From one point of consciousness, uh, I'm here, and another point of consciousness, I want the experience of this here. Is there a way to do that? Okay, well, let's unpack the whole model of quantum physics. Okay, so you look at an atom. An atom is 99.99999% nothing. And I say nothing, I mean it's energy, it's nothing. It's a 0.00000001% physical and material. And it is and a science. Yeah, that's what we're made of. And it's a scientific fact. It's the, the mathematics prove that we're perceiving less than 1% of reality. Okay, so what we're perceiving then is the frequency of light, the wavelength of light coming off the sun, which is the, the rainbow, mm -hmm. bouncing off of objects that give us the illusion of separation in three-dimensional reality, okay? That's, that's what all we're seeing, right? We're seeing and experiencing the material world by light being, being projected onto it take away the light out of three-dimensional reality, um, you don't really have a whole lot of experience of it. You bump into a lot of things. I mean, take away all light. Okay. Mm. So, so the, the, the atom is both particle material mm -hmm. and wave. Mm -hmm. And what's wave? What is wave? Frequency. What is frequency? Energy. What does frequency and energy do? They carry information. Yep. Okay. So the quantum field then is that invisible field of energy a frequency that exists beyond our senses that we're not perceiving, but it still exists. Just because we're unaware of it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Okay, so how much of your waking day in your waking life do you put your attention on matter? And how much of your waking day do you put your attention on frequency and energy? Well, throw in the hormones of stress, and your attention's on your body, on the environment and time, where you place your attention is where you place your energy. Mm -hmm. So now all of your energy and attention is, is invested in this three-dimensional reality, and it appears really real because that's where our attention is. Okay. So in that state, we said, okay, if the quantum field exists, we know it does, uh, we're just unaware of it. We can experience it with our senses. The only thing that we can experience it with is our awareness. Okay. So let's think about the quantum field. Yeah. Let's take away everything physical and material in the entire universe. Let's take away all the bodies, all the people, all the things, all the objects, all the places. Take away the earth, take away the moon, take away all the planets, take away all the moons from the planets, take away the light from the planets, take away the sun, take away the light from the sun, take away the stars, take the galaxy, take away all the light from all the stars. What are you left with? A vacuum, a void, nothing physical, right? It's just, it's, it's nothing. Waveform? Waveform? It's just energy, exactly. Energy it's waveform. all well the You've same. Experienced that at some point. Yeah. The, so the same energy that's mm -hmm. made up uh, is making up the atom is the same is the same exact void or vacuum that the entire universe sits in. So so okay. So we discovered that if we ask people to go from a narrow focus, uh, where they're focusing on something physical and material ask them to expand their focus or broaden their focus and take their attention off of everything known, everything physical and material, and keep investing their attention and energy on nothing, somehow <laughs> the brain gets very orderly and very coherent. 
uh, different compartments of the brain that were once divided start to unify. Now that void, that vacuum, that immaterial, that nothing, the ether, the formless, the structuralist, whatever you want to call that, is pregnant in possibilities. Mm -hmm. Now, in that realm of the quantum, you have to cross through a door. And what we discovered is if you take your attention off your body, you take your attention off of everybody in your life, you take your attention off your cell phone and everything that you, everything that's physical and material, mm -hmm. you take your attention off where you're sitting, where you sleep, where you live, where you work, where you need to be, and you take your attention off the familiar past or the predictable future and you find the sweet spot of the present moment and you go to this place of being nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, and no time, you're disinvesting all of your attention and energy out of this three-dimensional reality. And the moment you do that, you cross through the fourth dimension, which is time. Mm -hmm. And that's yep. the moment you become pure consciousness. That's the moment we call getting beyond yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, people are so conditioned that they're a name, they're a face, they're a body, they're a diet, they're a disease, they're a profession, they're a personality, they're an identity. You have to lay all of that down. You can't walk through the door to the quantum field as a somebody, you got to walk through as a nobody. So that process of getting beyond yourself, it takes, it takes a couple days in our retreats for people to actually disentangle from their programs and their conditioning and, and their unconscious thoughts, which makes up 95% of who we are by the time we're in the middle mm -hmm. of our life, to, 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 to be greater than our unconscious habits and behaviors and really work with the body that wants to feel an emotion from something and you're sitting there and it's getting agitated and impatient and frustrated and all you're doing is sitting there should tell us volumes about ourselves so that process of overcoming the self is actually the process of becoming somebody else so yeah. the person can linger as pure consciousness and emptiness in a vacuum and a void and be comfortable there they're they're existing in the unknown. That's where all those possibilities exist. And we enter a realm called time space. Now that's the fifth dimension. Now this is heady, but just hang in there with me. In the quantum, there's an infinite amount of time. Time is eternal. Now, mm -hmm. if, the, if time is eternal, if it's your, there's an eternal now, imagine how many things you could get done if you had an infinite amount of time an infinite number of possibilities. That's the quantum. Now, in the quantum, there's nothing structural. There's nothing material. There's nothing physical. There's no form, right? So what right. is it made of? It's made of energy, frequency, vibration, thought, consciousness, information. And yeah. every thought in that realm has a frequency. So all possibilities already exist. You don't have to create the possibility. In fact, all you have to do is become aware that it exists. Mm-hmm. The moment you do that, you, you're changing the thought and you're producing a different frequency. Now, if the person is astute enough to feel the frequency of the thought in the quantum and not wait for the experience to happen, but the thought of abundance would produce the feeling of abundance. For most people in three-dimensional reality, the thought of abundance produces the lack of not having it. That's why they're trying to create it, right? But in the quantum, you got to feel it in order to experience it. Okay, so as you get closer and closer to that point, that source, that singularity, pure love, the zero point field, whatever you want to call it, the universal mind that the creator, pure consciousness, as you get closer and closer to it, the closer you get to it, the more bliss, the more love, the more, the more um, ecstasy you feel, uh, then you're not no longer creating from lack or separation, the closer you get to it, in the process of creation, the shorter the distance between the thought of what you want and the experience of having it, between the cause and the effect from one point of consciousness and the other point of consciousness. So then people can create from the field instead of from matter if they have a coherent brain and a coherent heart and they actually can send the coherent signal out and feel the emotion ahead of the experience then those synchronicities and opportunities that they're creating from fifth dimensional reality requires doing less. Somehow it's drawn to us or it comes to us. It comes in ways that we least expect that surprises us. Like, whoa, where did that come from? And now what does that do? It proves to you that you're the creator of your life that instead of the victim of your life. And what's a victim? You say to someone, why are you feeling this way? What's wrong with you today? And they say, I am this way. 
because of that person, because of that circumstance. What they're really saying is that person or circumstance is actually controlling my feelings and controlling my thoughts. Well, anything that's controlling my feelings and my thoughts, I'm victim to, right? So yeah. it makes sense then that when things are good, you, you feel good. And when things are bad, you feel bad, right? So, so when you start changing the way you think and feel and it starts producing outcomes in your life, you're going to believe you're more you're, you're the creator of your life and less of the victim of your life. And, and the hardest part of about all of this is just making the time to do it. Ah, well, you just landed on, I have two things I want to ask in mind, but the first was, why is it so damn hard? Like, why is it so hard to get to that place where you can, whether it be believe that leads to knowing, like, why, what is, what are those big hurdles for people to get over? And, you know, one is making the time to do it, but then there's like being in it and actually in it being hard. Like I struggle with that sometimes you, where you really em to, to embody the, the feeling and to really like get yourself there. It's, it feels like there's so many blockages. It's a difficult mm -hmm. thing to yeah. achieve. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's so much easier to forget this information than to remember it. I think it's, uh, I think we're wired, huh. so wired uh, to, for such limitation, you know, and, and, uh, as I said, my belief about human potential has changed so dramatically. So the first thing I think is so valuable is this information and the right information. Sure. You know, we do really best, our best to combine quantum physics with neuroscience, with neuroendocrinology, yeah. with psychoneuroimmunology, mind-body connection, epigenetics, protein metabolism, cellular biology, electromagnetism. Why? Because if knowledge is power, yeah. knowledge about yourself is self-empowerment. So every time you learn something new, you're forging connections in your brain. But the research mm -hmm. shows if you don't repeat it, you don't review it, you don't think about it. They prune apart within hours or even days. So if learning is making those connections then remembering is maintaining and sustaining them. Okay, so if you can build a model of understanding with people and nothing is left to conjecture, nothing is left to superstition, nothing's left to dogma, mm -hmm. and they can learn that information. And instead of getting on their cell phone and scrolling through their social media or looking at whatever, or watching TV or getting distracted, if they learn that information and they have the opportunity to teach it back to somebody, and they begin to share that information in right in the event, right? It's like so the in the retreats, in the retreats, yeah. you, when you when you give information to people, you're like, okay, now talk to talk about it to each other, and we yeah. stop and we talked about it, and and it's it, it become if you don't understand the information well enough, you can't explain it. Yeah, it's not wired in your brain but right. if you can explain it you're right. installing the neurological hardware in your brain right. for what in preparation for the experience so we've discovered the more mm -hmm. you understand what you're doing yeah and why you're doing it yeah. the better results the how gets easier and you assign meaning to the task and when you sure. assign meaning to a task the prefrontal cortex turns on and says to the brain shut up Mm -hmm. Quiet down here. This is a moment where I want to really execute really well. And it silences all the other circuits in the brain so you can focus on a single minded thought. So if there's doubt, if there's conjecture, if there's superstition, then there's hope and there's trying and there's wishing and there's wanting. But if you really can understand the what and the why, then the how becomes so much more instrumental. So because you install the circuitry in your brain to do something with it. Okay, so. If we give people numerous opportunities to experience the truth of that philosophy, that theory, that knowledge, that information, that's still, it's still void of experience. Get enough mm, yeah. people together <laughs> and teach them, instruct them how to do it. Give them numerous opportunities to overcome themselves, numerous opportunities to connect. Mm. Sooner or later, they're going to start figuring it out. And that's what happens at our events now. So when they have the experience of doing it well, and they feel the emotion like, wow, that felt really good. The emotion is now teaching the body chemically right. to understand what the mind understood. So it's not just in the mind. Now it's in the body. You're embodying the truth of that philosophy. Now you get that feeling of getting it right. And you feel unlimited. You feel grateful. You feel empowered. You feel whatever that is and it's you're not visceral. getting it it can get visceral like it really should like be. You get, it should you be sweat visceral or you cry or you should be. get excited you feel it you can feel it in your heart you can feel it in your whole body it should be visceral yeah. right and so that so yeah. then you so now now when you have that feeling you go oh, i got to remember this feeling this is yeah. this is what i'm doing it for right okay yeah. so so then if you've done it once then you got to be able to do it again 
And mm-hmm. that's the that's the that's the key. And if you can keep repeating the experience, you start mastering the knowledge, and mm-hmm. you neurochemically condition your mind and body to begin to work as one. And when you've done it right. enough times, well, you know this. You're 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 you're, you're excelled in, in in automotive racing, so you, it gets automatic. It gets easy. It gets second nature. The things that you had to put so much conscious attention on in the beginning. You actually don't have to pay a lot of attention to because you've kind of mastered it's hardwired now it's automatic well, we're programmable right? right exactly which leads <laughs> me to what i'm curious i'm like i want to have a little bit of a almost a philosophical or maybe perspective conversation on what are we and tell a story that i experienced i went ahead and gave myself a hero's dose of psilocybin and experienced myself as waveform all that reality is is inter like intersecting with these waveforms sometimes they cross sometimes they go over each other over and over again whatever all that's what it was and that to get back to being human i had to agree to uh the mind which essentially was the ego the stories it's the lie i knew it wasn't Mm -hmm. real to be human but that i had to agree to the mind to build that construct and so that kind of fits in with the things you're saying is is being in this waveform and so it makes me wonder what are we and then when i think about you explaining us as humans whether it's breaking the habit of being yourself and reprogramming yourself like your book or you know the things you just said it's like we're a lot like a computer what the hell are we <laughs> well well look i mean that's a that's a pretty heavy question but yep but I you're will, up for it i will tell you that at our very nature we are divine at our very nature we are the blooming of material, which and material reality, right, is is the most stable form of energy. That's really what it is. You start climbing up closer to source, and it gets way more fluid, way more uh, dynamic. But but matter is the slowest frequency that we perceive with our senses, sure. and so mm-hmm. so that so that that one percent of reality that we perceive. Don't exclude yourself uh, in that equation. You're part of that. There's a ninety nine percent of the unknown self that has fallen source from singularity, from oneness, from wholeness, from pure love, all the way down into density, fooled by our senses into the illusion of separation. Why did we come from source? Because we were one, and and then what if we were many? And what if there's, is there anything else but oneness? And that question starts the whole journey of every single person having a piece of source in them to answer the question, to explore, is there more? is there what 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 is how big is eternity how much can we experience and now the journey is down in the density uh and then you experience everything and then all of a sudden you get to a point where nothing is making that feeling of emptiness go away and you ask the same question this is when the soul wakes up and you start wondering is there anything else besides this is this it and that's a moment we start remembering that we are divine and so at our very at our very core we're, we're, we're pure love. That's what we are. And so, so then the, the journey is to discover the unknown self. The, the journey is, can I heal myself? Uh, can I, if I heal myself, can mm-hmm. I heal somebody else? Which mm-hmm. is, you have data to show that you can. If I heal myself and I heal someone else, can I heal someone else at a distance? We have data to show that you can do that. These are all new experiences. Yeah. And the feelings that come from the experience of people who are actually healing another person hmm. is a feeling that's transcendent of any anything in the three-dimensional world. The, the, the watching a mother whose child was born with a birth defect that never engaged with her brothers or couldn't hold her head up and was listless after one remote healing is now smiling and looking at her brothers. I mean, in the mother who tells that story, um, you know, we're all on the call there and we're sobbing in so much where there's an empathy that takes place where you're, you're mm-hmm. contributing into someone's life in some way and you're sharing the feeling that that person is feeling. And yeah. the greatest form of gratitude is when we receive gratitude. So you're part of someone else's transformation and pro-social networks switch on and the species of human beings does something so important. We move right. closer together, we commune, we trust, we support, we inform, we love, we heal, right. we shine. And, and then our appreciation for everything in the moment, we see more beauty in the moment. Stress hormones divide us, separate mm-hmm. us, mm-hmm. cause us to be selfish. This is the, the, the so who we are. Less who, as it's a less co- of who we really are. 
Exa exactly. We move further away from love, right? So, of course, speaking from my present state of ignorance, what I've discovered is that when people have that moment of connection, we see this on the brain scan. Their brain scan goes into such an aroused that scientists that look at it actually think the person's having something really wrong go on with them, you know, because they think seizure, they think, what is this? But the arousal is not coming from fear. The arousal is not coming from pain. And the arousal is not coming from anger or aggression. That's what typically switches on the arousal system. This arousal is ecstasy. This arousal is bliss. This is the person actually dipping into the divine and touching it. And they feel it in every single atom in their body, all mm -hmm. resonating in order. The side effect of that is some transcendental experience that produces a shift in the perception of the way they perceive reality. The right. spectrum of reality is broadened and the feeling is not chemical. The mm. feeling is kind of electric. It's kind of frequency, it's energy. And that person right. many times has a biological upgrade. There's the tumor on their throat, now it's gone. There's mm. the Parkinson's disease, now it's gone. There's the eczema, now it's gone. There's the paralysis from the surgery. Now the person's walking. There's an, their, their, their interaction with energy and frequency is mm. causing a part of the brain called the autonomic nervous system, the limbic brain, is, is resonating in such high frequency. Remember, stress is autonomic dysregulation. Mm -hmm. This is autonomic, high amount of autonomic regulation. And every cell in the body is getting informed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with more wholeness, more oneness, more love, and um, that cells emit more coherent light and information, and the person all of a sudden realizes never was outside of them. So the journey right. back to source, the journey back to oneness, the journey back, everybody gets to, you can be anybody you want to be in three dimensions, <laughs> you, you can be any character you want to be in the virtual reality experiences, the simulation that we're experiencing. But if you're living by the same emotions every day, or you can't get out of bed because you can predict the feeling of everything that's going to happen in your life, then nothing's going to change until you change. And the discovery of, okay, most people have to hit their lowest point in their life where that nothing's making that feeling go away to finally look at how they think, look yeah. at how they act, look at how they feel. My message is, why wait for that? Like, and so what we're discovering is in seven days, in seven days, the science that we have is so compelling to show that in seven days, there will be a host of biological changes that take place in a person's body to actually look like they're living in a new environment, they're living in a whole new life. So then getting over yourself to answer your mm -hmm. question is the difficulty. That's why people will say, oh, it's too hard for me. But what they're really saying is I don't believe in it. I don't really don't believe in it. Because if you believe in it, you got to show up. Mm -hmm. And if you don't believe in it, then you don't believe in yourself. And you don't believe in yourself, that means you don't believe in possibility. Hmm. And if you don't believe in possibility, that means you can't believe in yourself, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so this, this idea we're all then- potential possibilities. Exactly. If we're connected to everything, what you're saying is, is that when people have this upgrade, they connect with more of themselves with essentially essentially if we're not we're not separate from anything then you connect with more of yourself and you get bigger your energy exactly. gets bigger you get upgraded makes me wonder like what is consciousness then because that was another feeling i had was that i was aware of being waveform i was a, i'm also aware of being human so yeah. there's this overlay of consciousness over the top of the whole experience. Ah, very good, very good, because source is pure consciousness. It's the consciousness of everybody, of everyone, of everything, of everywhere, and every We're time. Yeah, of course. We're a fish in water asking for a drink. We're a sponge <laughs> sitting right. in the ocean wondering where's the ocean. It's, all, it's within <laughs> us, yeah. and it's all around us, and we just haven't made the time to be patient enough to actually put our attention on it. And once we become aware of it, it is conscious that it's, it's conscious of us. It's, it's a collect, it's a consciousness of everybody, of everybody. You're not separate from it. So then there's, there's subjective consciousness, you and I, you know, there, there is one source, but in that source, there are many, but there's one divine in that divine. There are many, there's one God in that God. There are many. Okay. Everybody's got a spark of the divine in them. Okay, so that's subjective consciousness. And then there's the objective consciousness. 
how how come the planets are rotating in such order how come there's forces of nature that have so much order after the big bang there should have been disorder that's what happens after an explosion yeah. how come there's so much order after an explosion well there's only one reason for that and that's because there's a consciousness that's that's aware of the whole entire thing because the very fabric of everything material is energy and i mean breaking 99 percent, everything material is actually energy it's just stable consciousness and mm -hmm. it's the slowest form frequency the slowest energy that's stable that we can perceive with our senses mm -hmm. climb up the scale cl closer to source and it gets very very dynamic and very different so so the discovery then of consciousness and its never-ending process of self-discovery and answering the question is there more because most people wake up in the morning and the first thing they do is since the brain is a record of the past they think about their problems <laughs> Those are memories that are etched in the brain that are connected to certain people and objects, certain things at certain times and places. The moment you start remembering your problems, you're thinking in the past. That's what a memory is. Every one of those problems has an emotion associated mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. The moment you feel unhappy, the moment you feel discouraged, the moment you feel frustrated, now you're in the past. Thoughts are the language of the brain, feelings are the yeah. language of the body. So most people unconsciously take that thought and that feeling, that memory, that emotion, that stimulus and response. Yeah. Now the body is the mind. So yeah. when it comes time to change and you got to step from that known familiar feeling and make a different choice and step into the unknown, the body says, uh, listen, um, you think you've been running the show here for the last 20 years, but actually I've been running the show. I've actually been telling you the choices to make so you can feel that familiar feeling to reaffirm you. It's an incredible computer. We're just a simulation. So the body gets conditioned there. And now to overcome the body takes a will that's greater than the program to, to right. no longer get up and run through the same routine that you do every day. And your body wants to, in the middle of meditation saying, quit, I'm too tired. You got too many texts. You got too many emails. You got too many things to do. The body's been programmed to get up and go. And you, and you say, wait, 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 wait a second here. We're not going anywhere until I get clear on who I want to be today. Mm. And every time you execute that will that's greater than the program people say oh i'm i can't meditate actually you're doing it right <laughs> actually that's why it's hard because doing it you're actually that is the process right there there's no such thing as a bad yeah. meditation yeah. what you're doing is actually exactly what you need to do and every time you do that mm -hmm. You become conscious that you go unconscious. That's how you actually develop the skill of consciousness. Mm -hmm. It's not being conscious. It's catching yourself when you go unconscious. Yeah. And people, if they can Thinking see that. Thinking is the unconscious, essentially. Right. Conscious right. is connecting to everything, which right. is in the space of nothingness, really. But there's a journey to get there. Yeah. And if you're patient with yourself and you see that as a victory, like, yeah. oh, you start getting aroused, you start getting frustrated, and you think, oh, I can't do this. And you go, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. We're not going to quit here. That would be me getting up as the same person. I'm mm -hmm. curious what's on the other side of this frustration. You settle your body back down into the present moment. You unfold back into that eternal space. I'm telling you, every time you do that, it's a victory. You're telling the body it's no longer the mind, that you're the mind. And yeah. it actually turns out that the body starts liberating energy. It starts liberating energy, but like an unbridled stallion, it goes, oh, really? You think that's all you think that's all you have? Watch this. And then it gets starts bringing up memories of the past and stuff. all of that just to feel an emotion. And if you're aware that it's doing that and you mm -hmm. settle it down, you're, you're taming the animal. Yeah. You're teaching it. You're yeah. you're teaching it how to change its state. Right. And guaranteed. If you keep doing that, you walk out in your life, I guarantee you, you'll be less responsive and reactionary to everyone and everything. So in seven days, we see that not only there are dramatic biological changes to suggest that the person for an environment, but it, it goes for the majority of people that immerse themselves in going all in. And mm -hmm. what does that mean? A different environment, they're in a ballroom. They're in a ballroom. I've been to thousands of ballrooms. There's nothing really exciting in a ballroom. What's exciting in a ballroom? They all look the same. But the data suggests that they're in a whole new environment. Where where is that where is that taking place? It's taking place well, from within the person. Closed eyed internal world is of course. Everything. everything. When you open your eyes, you get locked into static things that just exist. But when you close your eyes, and this is kind of one of the things that <clears throat> 
different states of being, whether it's induced by meditation or plant medicines or those things, they show you that there's a whole big universe inside when you close your eyes, but when you open them, it slows things out. It's almost like I had the feeling like being human is actually a pause because there's so much information available that this goes, okay, so there's a picture, there's the window, there's a, okay. And then my dog and, right, right. um, <clears throat> and it just feels like, you know, you get to slow down for a second, but in that closed eyed world, there's a lot yeah. there. Yeah. It's really slow here. It's really slow here. And, and everything material is actually a symbol. And every we we're perceiving it as a symbol because we couldn't handle oh, yeah. all the information, be able to function mm -hmm. all at mm -hmm. once. That's the challenge. That's exactly what happened. In that waveform, I was asking questions and getting answers. And I am a I like I have a lot of questions. <laughs> I do too. This is why I interview people. <laughs> I do too. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was getting all the answers every time I asked. And it was like rapid fire. And I popped up after like two hours and I'm like, I just can't hold the frequency. It's too much information. And that's when I said being human is a pause from all the information. I can't hold that frequency. And that's what made me realize that's why we have to grow and um, gr like raise our consciousness level slowly because it's slowly. too much information. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it's too overloading. You would short yeah. circuit. You just shut down. You I can't do this anymore. But there's yeah. so well, because there's everything, which is essentially back to the 5D is that, you know, and I go like that because of how you described it, like 3Ds, you know, A to B, Linear. 5D yeah. is, 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 All now. is vertical. All now. Yeah. All now moments. All now. And all so possibilities exist everything yeah. in that space in the present and I got moment every answer i wanted yeah it's a lot uh, and and i think you're absolutely correct about that i mean to fall from singularity down into density uh, you had to forget that you were oneness <laughs> you have to yeah. forget it you also forget. reminded me of that i was like that's yeah. why we forget too because otherwise yeah. you couldn't you couldn't participate in this reality if you knew this wasn't real Right. And you, th we really think that this is real. We really and, do. And, and it's actually, and actually this reality couldn't exist without the other one. Right. So, so. Have so you ever I, had an experience like that? Have you, am yeah. I speaking, have you, can you. So, so, I mean, my, my whole thing, uh, what I love uh, on my own journey is really, is really the mystical. I mean, yeah. the mystical being the unknown, of course. Yeah. And, and, and that process mm -hmm. of self-discovery, when you truly hit that fertile void that beautiful place where of singularity where your consciousness is actually merged with the greater consciousness there's no separation right um the thought of what you're thinking about actually gives you the exact experience or the information because it's all information there um a, a, a whole portal of possibilities open my hope is that when i come back to three-dimensional reality that I take a piece of that with me because every mystical experience yeah. that I've ever had, <clears throat> I've always come back and said, Joe Dispenza, <laughs> you got this all wrong, dude. It's you got it all wrong. You're that's not the way it is. It's not that way. And so some veil, yeah, some conditioning, some illusion Pulling is away. removed. And all of a sudden I see things how they really are. And, mm -hmm. and it's not the way I have been conditioned or programmed. And so that process, is should be integrated into our nervous system because if it happens too randomly or too quickly uh, we can't function in our three-dimensional world and we got to right. be able to function right we got to keep one foot in the real world right. and one foot right. in the quantum world otherwise you know you wind up with a psychosis and you can't exactly. function right so so it's healthy for for us to interact uh, at the level of our ability to be able to process it and every now and then you have a big one and it's more than you can take. I've had those too, but but for me personally, I want to hear about that. That's what I want to hear about. I want to hear about in a story and experience. Well, well, um, I never really want to make it be about me, but there are plenty of people that have <clears throat> really profound moments. Uh, you know, I'm looking. You know, I'm a I'm a very empirical when it comes to stuff like this. And you know, when you see someone's brain scan go off the chart, I mean, off the chart. And they could be vegan, they could be gluten free, they could eat meat, doesn't matter. Like we've we asked all the questions. But when you see the person's brain like mm -hmm. light up like that, not a little bit. I mean, the mathematical probability of some of these brainwave states, according to the research, is 
they say statistically impossible to occur. And if it does occur, it would be a random event that would last for a millisecond. And you see this sustained state in the brain and it's hundreds and hundreds of standard deviations outside of normal. Three mm -hmm. standard deviations outside of normal is 2% of the population, and that's really good. Now you're talking hundreds past that point. This person is having a very transcendental moment. The stories that they tell like, oh my God, I just, the divine was, it was always there, I just was unaware of it. Or I met my future self, and my future self does not have colon cancer, I'm telling you, I know it. I know it. And when you look at a brain scan like that, you think this person's having some inner event that they can't make their brain do that. You know, it's kind of happening to them. So somehow, and this has happened to me, they're the observer. They're, they're experiencing whatever it's experiencing. They're outside of time experiencing, <laughs> looking at themselves, having it. And they're in the future at the same time at, those, at that person realizing I'm healed from this colon cancer. And all of it's happening simultaneously. You cannot go back to business as usual right. and live your life in the same mediocre way. It's just impossible. You know too much. So the seduction or the interest then becomes not about experiencing anything in this 3D world. Now, do I think I love my 3D world? I love to eat. I love to. I chose to came back, come back. I was like, I want to come back. At one point, there was a choice to not come back. And I was like, no, no, no. I want to be human. Yeah, I know. Listen, I love it. I love the journey of all of that. I just think that there's more to reality than we perceive. And I think it's an instinct yeah. in our mind. Yeah. It's an intuition in our heart that never seems to go away. And I think it's that feeling that brings people uh, yeah. to, the, to, to, to really that process of discovery. They may not be able to explain it yeah. or put it into words, but they feel it and they felt it their entire lives. And the, what that feeling is, is that this isn't, this cannot be the end. This, it just can't be. So, and yeah. so what do I find so promising is that uh, I said to my scientific team the other day, I said, I, I can't believe this is the truth. I really cannot believe this is the truth. I mean, what was once considered pseudoscience, we now have data. My, my, one of our top scientists did a presentation a couple of weeks ago, and his last line, this is a very well-published guy, 175 papers. His last line is, you are what you think. That was his last line. I looked at him and I thought, who is this Buddha on the stage? Like, I cannot believe. So when you say, I can't believe this is true, what's the thing that you can't believe? The body and the nervous system is manufacturing an, a, an endogenous group of pharmaceuticals in the body, innately in the body, that works way better than any drug. Like, well, it's always little... mimicking us, right? Isn't that the, the the sort of the thing is that drugs usually mimic something in nature or something within us? Right. But what the data says is like, okay, you do a drug study, it's about 18 to 25% causality, cause and effect. Well, that's mm -hmm. not bad. Our data is 75% cause and effect. It's, it works three times better, four times better than any drug. And yet it's hmm. within us. And I keep saying to the scientists, where are all those chemicals coming from? The person's not taking anything. They're sitting there with yeah. their eyes closed. It's the frequency when there's a coherent brain and a coherent heart, the, the nervous system can actually tune and read that frequency. And what, are they, what is it reading? It's reading information. So energy is informing matter. And the, what we're capturing in the blood, in the cell, in the gene, in the brain is somehow information that is a result of their interaction with frequency and energy and so it's outside of, of us you're saying it's in the field it's it's in, it's well i couldn't say it's outside of us i'd say it's within us and all around us where yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's somehow yeah. there's a connection or an awareness that mm. happens and so what do i think is occurring that's so beautiful right now and and, and <clears throat> i'm a pretty optimistic person the last two years you know i keep asking myself when is all of this going to end is there an end in sight when i look at the world and I've been so kind of like, oh, God, how are we going to get through this? And I think the veil is really thinning now. Like, I really yeah. believe the veil between worlds is thinning. And I am so optimistic after our last event in Niagara Falls. People were walking up to the stage that came with crutches and, and canes and were just dropping them on the stage. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. They were transformed profoundly. I'm like, wow, I have hope again. I have hope that we, we don't need anybody or anything any longer to find happiness or love. Those people were making themselves happy. They were making themselves better. That No one else was doing that. They were doing it on their own. What a powerful, empowering 
uh, opportunity for people. And, and it's the four minute mile. It's the four minute mile. The ladies, the physician stood on the stage with, with really severe, she's a surgeon. She couldn't do surgery anymore because she had such severe carpal tunnel, had the surgery, nothing was helping. One mm. moment, one moment in one walking meditation, completely gone. She told the story on the stage. By the end of the event, someone else, health and wellness starts to become as infectious as disease. Why? Because it's in the field, it's in consciousness, and you're witnessing the evidence in three-dimensional reality. That's so powerful, really powerful. Well, it makes me think about time. And I think about like talking to Greg Braden and talking about, and maybe you guys have had this conversation um, about just time, and you've surely had this experience though and time accelerating and speeding up and i'm wondering if there's any thoughts around that or like any scientific data or just or like anecdotal even with your experience and what you're seeing that and how important it is to anchor new realities like we've been talking yeah. about from the field because of this acceleration of time. And now I'm not saying I know that scientifically or factually, I'm just saying it feels like it. Mm. It feels like things are speeding up, whether it's the veil thinning, creating, um, waking up, uh, it just feels like that. So what have you experienced? Um, I'll explain, for me, I'll explain it in two ways. I mean, one of the ways is unfortunately technology is actually causing us to experience more things in a shorter amount of time. Okay. I mean, yeah. 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 We can do so much yeah. more in a shorter amount of time. Uh, and the side effect of that, unfortunately, is that attention spans have shortened uh, because you can shift your attention from one thing to the next. And if you keep doing something over and over again, you develop a habit. So, so to the person who is in three dimensional reality, because of technology, you can get more done in a shorter amount of time or more things are happening in a shorter amount of time. So the, the, so there's an quickening in human consciousness because the pace has increased, right? The problem with that is that you can get on Amazon Prime and you get something delivered to your door, door the next day or sometimes even the same day. There's this kind of entitlement of convenience that takes place where we really think that um, you know everything's going to be handed to us or mm -hmm. we can get whatever we want nothing wrong with that that's really cool that's really great but in the creative process um you actually have to get outside of time in order for you to be able to create because mm -hmm. if you're trying to predict what's going to happen in the next moment if you keep romancing what happens you're not in the present moment the familiar past is the known. The predictable future is the known. The present moment is the unknown. That is where all possibilities exist. So, mm -hmm. yes, there is a function of three-dimensional reality and technology where more things are happening in a shorter amount of time. Certainly, there's some type of energetic thing that's taking place uh, in so many ways. And to me, that energy is actually endorsing whoever you want to be. That's what I believe. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be a victim get ready because it's going to get really good for you hmm. uh, because that energy is more available. If you want to heal, wow, there's a lot of people healing now and they're using that energy instrumentally yeah. in a positive way. Hmm. So, so yes, there's a quickening that's taking place and it's creating quite a contrast or extremes that are taking place in reality. And the more extreme it gets, the more unstable the system, right? So, uh, uh governments, um, uh, journalism, uh, education, religion, medicine, uh, everything's kind of fallen apart, you know, um, uh, mm. and, and it's very obvious to people that has to happen for a new consciousness to emerge. The thing is, we can't face these changes uh, programmed because we'll just add to uh, the chaos. We actually have to be relaxed and awake instead of stressed out and unconscious. And we have the data to show that when you're relaxed and awake, amazing things can actually happen to you instead of in survival, stressed out and in a program. So yeah. in order to create out something new, we gotta, be, we gotta be in the present moment and we have to be outside that pace mm -hmm. of where everything's moving very quickly. And, and mm -hmm. technology, unfortunately, is causing people, it's, it's causing people to think. Uh, uh, instead of them, f for them to think on their own. And I'm concerned about that because um, I never p tell people what to think. I, I, I want them to think for themselves. I think it's really important for us to think for ourselves. So there's an acceleration that's taking place energetically, but I do think that that acceleration is really just endorsing uh, uh, who, who you're being. So master the moment and, yeah. and learn how to be a creator 
uh, I think that amazing things happen. And, and that's exactly what we're discovering uh, over and over again in, in just witnessing the, the science is uh, absolutely supporting the, the, that you are greater than you think, more powerful than you know, more unlimited than you can ever dream. We have the data over and over again that suggests that. And the yeah. testimonials that we have in hundreds of people, we have cancer researchers mm -hmm. standing on the stage with cancer, completely gone. We see stage four cancers and bones and organs and liver and lungs. Com metastatic cancer just doesn't typically go away um, very easily. And out of the bones, there's no sign of it anywhere. I mean, not once, not, not twice, over and over. And we had two people at an event that were blind. I mean, no, hmm. you know, I'm, you know, I'm a healthy skeptic. Wow. I mean, this woman That's saw crazy. her face for the first time in, in the mirror. That's and crazy. It was too, too good of a story to pass up. You can't make these up. So the testimony is the four mm -hmm. minute mile. What was once considered impossible. I mean, muscular dystrophy, really? The physicians that were in the audience that, that were disbelievers, they, they, they were in tears. They just could not imagine that this could actually take place. It wasn't matter to matter. You know, it wasn't 3D reality trying to change 3D reality. That was not it. It was, it was energy that was actually informing matter. They could never do it that way. It, could, it had to, it had to hap, happen another way. So you have this amazing evidence in scientific research, and you have this amazing evidence in human testimony. And evidence is the loudest voice. And I'm so optimistic now for the first time in a long time that we actually can actually find our way here, that, that, that we have to come together, community of the same consciousness that isn't angry, they've overcome their anger, that isn't fearful, yeah. they've overcome their fear, they're not suffering or in pain, they've overcome that in their own personal work, and they're actually showing the world what love looks like, they're showing the world what greatness looks like, they're demonstrating for the world, they're not talking about it philosophically, they're actually demonstrating who they are, so the person who witnesses them says, wow, something is really different about you, what's different about you? I don't know. Well, there's something different about you because the person is not the the person who's perceiving them doesn't match their memory of them any longer. There's yeah, something different right. about the person, and that's exactly what this world needs. That collective networks of observers wow. determine reality. Do you believe More in the hundredth monkey theory? I do. I'm actually. I'm. I'm not. It's not that I believe it. I. I know it now because I'm <laughs> seeing. Four people with Raynard syndrome in one event all heal. I mean, I mean that is that is a collective. That's a morphogenic What's field. What's the there. possibility that we see the hundredth monkey theory uh, come into effect on our level of consciousness globally within our I think, lifetime? I think as we get close, as, as time speeds up like it is, it gets more and more unpredictable to determine when it's going to happen. But I will tell you this: I'm so optimistic if we can continue. Uh, staying awake, relaxed and awake, and continually doing the work and keep pushing the edge of what's possible. The brain, it's really funny, you know, the brain actually changes the most when you get to the point where you think you can't go any further. If you go past that point, if you just go past that point, mm -hmm. that's when you see the greatest brain changes. And so mm -hmm. we actually push people past that point and we yeah. give them some tools to what to do there. And lo and behold, we, we see it young people, old people, we see it educated, uneducated, we see uh, healthy, sick. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's uh, cause none of that matters. It's just, it, it's, it's just a, their ability to be able to execute. So well, it's the reprogramming. It's, 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 it's like unprogramming, reprogramming. It can, you know, when you, you know, use a fire, what wall service to, you know, burn things down. It's alchemy too, right? It's some mm -hmm. sort of alchemical process happening where you are like short circuiting something and growing something new and growing pains are called that for a reason. Well, let's say, let's make it really simple. If we are pure love, if you're on the journey, anything that is not love and you must die and or in order for you to find yeah. true or true love, pure love, a part of you must die. And I think that's yeah. the difference between right. knowing the path uh, uh, and walking right. the path. And walking right. the path right. is really what it's about. Right. How do you, as you move through your life and you have done such phenomenal things and continue to do more and more, how do you get your information to know what comes next? Like where, what direction to turn your head, to turn your energy? Where does that come from and in what form? Um, well, I never planned on doing any of this, <laughs> really. 
Um, yeah, and my theory from the very beginning is uh, when when this kind of started to become of interest to people, I just said to my staff, um, here's how it's going to work. Um, I'll only go where I'm invited. If I'm not invited, I'll be a chef. I'll do something else. And so, so um, I'm constantly building my model of what I understand. And I'm like you always have a thousand questions. Now, mm-hmm. it's so much better for me to sit down and take a few minutes and instead of turning on my phone or doing anything. I actually like the process of contemplation. I like the process of saying to myself, so what do you know? Mm-hmm. At what point or at what point do you stop believing that this is the truth? Let's get right to that point and let's, let's build that understanding. So I'm constantly building my model and then I'm tearing it down mm-hmm. and then I'm challenging it and building it up again. And if I can't find like there's something that doesn't fit, then I got to find information somewhere that makes it fit, that makes sense to me. But then it's not enough for me there. Then I got to like, then I got to experience it. Like someone said to me, so what do you, someone said to me yesterday, so what are you doing in your morning meditations? I'm like, well, it's really funny because I'm, I'm actually developing a new understanding, a new model, and I want to teach it at the follow-up uh, uh, next month. And I'm actually practicing this, this new meditation to have the experience so that I can teach it better. So if I can have the experience of that knowledge and the model that I build, I know the journey and I can teach it much better. So I work really hard at being the example of, of what I teach. And I work really hard at getting information either from, uh, well, references or whatever, but also the information that I love to get it comes to me when I start connecting and then it all kind of makes sense. And so I think of as many ways as I can to teach it, but I also love to have the experience because when I have the experience then I can really teach it yeah. uh, on, a, on a much and deeper body. level. Yeah. And, and then now the other thing is just the, the scientific data, you know, we were just all on a research call yesterday. The data is so, so amazing right now that I can say so many more things with such conviction. I can say things now with conviction. I mean, uh, I can say like, I, I actually know that this is the truth. It's, it's so, and having that kind of conviction for me personally uh, allows me to trust more. And, and when I trust myself more, I trust the process more. Uh, and I can stay in that kind of uncertainty and that unknown and not, not move into survival uh, or I'm, or better yet, let me say it another way. When I'm uncomfortable because I don't have an answer mm-hmm. and I can continuously keep it on my mind, and I don't, you know, I always have it going somewhere and I'm, I'm, while I'm doing other things, it's always, I'm always thinking about it and trying to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Somehow, if I trust the process and I just go all in, yeah. um, somehow I run into, I run into the experience or I run into a greater understanding about it and, and, uh, and, and then I'm able to, then I'm able to articulate it and getting it from here to here sometimes, especially, you know, as you said, when you have transcendental moments, it's really hard to find words to be able to yeah. explain that it's it's inevitable it's like beyond words so so for me personally i mean i just i love the divine i mean i love the unknown i love the journey um i'm never going to stop asking questions right. i can't um every every new experience that i have forces me to think of an infinite number of possibilities from that experience that i would have never thought of without that experience so to me there's not infinity there's infinities like this is never ending process here. Like, oh, now we're on to the multiverse. Oh my gosh. The, oh, so overwhelming the universe, but also so amazing. So, okay. All right. We'll wrap it up. Like what you work your butt off. You do these retreats. You, oh my God, like you do every meditation. It's insane. I can't, I can't, I just can't imagine. I know that there's an aspect of energizing yourself through connection and, but then there's also, it's just also, it's also a lot. Um, so why, what's your mission? What's what, what do you hope to accomplish? through God, all this? I, I hope that on some level, Danica, that, that, uh, at the end of my life, uh, I feel like that I've contributed to the world in some way. I mean, I mean, uh, it's not about anything else about being a part of change and transformation. You've already done that. You've well, already done it's, that. Well, it's never ending. Like I'm pushing the envelope. Like there's, that's yeah. yeah. I, I want to know what's your size, of your envelope. Like, what's the ultimate goal? If you were, well, to I say, ch- yeah, this is what I hope. Yeah, I, I want everybody to be empowered uh, to realize that that they actually can make measurable changes in their life that they're not defined by their past that that, that they should they could be defined by a vision of the future uh, that that on some level we leave a legacy of information 
that shows people really that 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 that's the truth. And for me personally, um, I wanted to be there on the beach when that woman opened her eyes and could see for the first time. I wanted her. I wanted to be right there with her. And I want to celebrate that moment with her. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to be part of that. I think there's some something innate in us as human beings, as species, where we're but we inform each other and we 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 support each other we trust each other we love each other you know we, we heal each other we shine for each other so others can shine i think i think that there could be a world where we actually actually function in a, in a much a much healthier way and 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 i think this really is the defining time so if i could leave something that could change a person's life or help them in some way i i feel really good about it for me it just is a it's a mission that I gets me up in the morning, uh, and I love to be I love to be involved in, it. and, and I, I'm nothing really without my team, and mm -hmm. so my team is a really great, dedicated group of people. Our scientific team, our amazing minds that were healthy skeptics in the beginning, that now all do the work because they yeah. see it as medicine. They know it's medicine. They know how they've done drug studies. They know exactly what it looks like. Yeah. The stories and testimonials that people have. I watch them over and over again because it changes my belief. It changes my belief. And I love when scientists run an experiment five times in a row. I love when they do that because I know they're changing their belief right in that moment. They're expecting a sure. different result and they're getting the same result. And they're in, the, they're in science to discover and they're making a huge discovery. And it's never been outside of the human being in the beginning. So I, I don't know where I'm going to end up um, uh, in this process. But if I stay true to what I believe and then ask, keep asking greater questions. I hope we we have a, a really, really big breakthrough in, in human consciousness. And uh, that would be really satisfying to me. Do you hope someday or believe someday that we as humans will interact and walk alongside other extraterrestrials in the universe? Wow. Wow. Let's see how I can answer this. I wouldn't, I don't know if I would use the word extraterrestrial, but I will tell you that I've had enough experiences with interdimensional beings um, that, uh, God, I would be really foolish to say that they, they don't exist. And I think there's a very, very strong interest uh, in the human race right now. Uh, and of course, there's always characters that are deceiving along the way, without a doubt, and we have to discern. But God, I think, I think um, uh, if our consciousness uh, is in the state of love or in more connection, uh, I think they can lower their frequency to a certain point in what yeah. it's happened so many times in our events. I mean, people have had really profound healings and the stories that they tell about their interaction with some of these uh, interdimensional beings. I'm taking a risk here. Um, I really don't care about their subjective experience. What I care about is that their, their, their condition yeah. is gone. And so then what is real? I don't know, but whatever they experienced, uh, there goes all their, their, there goes their health condition. And, for them, they were interacting with that 99% of reality that we, we don't perceive uh, with our senses. And for them, it was so real that they their, 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 their body or their life changed in such dramatic ways. And, and God, that's so something to look forward to, mm -hmm. having a relationship mm. with somebody other than some, something physical, the way I think it's possible. It's a possibility in the quantum field. Um, I certainly think it's possible. I've had my own experiences. And, um, and, and then, then what? Then what? I mean, it just keeps going. Why are we interesting? Well, I don't think human beings are very interesting when they're you programmed. You said they're interested in us. You said, oh, they're oh yeah, of course. This is a very Why? critical. This is a very critical time for, for the human species because I think it's. I think it's a crossroads. I really think we're going to get it together, or we're not. Really, and I what does not is, mean? Well, I think it's. I just think it. This is game time. We and start over. We go with a, a nuclear, it's like, it's like a reboot. And if it does, if we do get it together, what does that look like? Well, I think, uh, I think that um, it's no longer a selfish consciousness. I think uh, it's a collective consciousness. I think yeah. uh, that, that we resolve all the problems in this world from the environment all the way to the monetary system, to politics, the government. Uh, to journalism, to education, religion, just from a greater level of consciousness, and there's not less separation. And and we actually show that 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 when we do this, we have random event generators in our in our in our events, and uh, it's it's just a sophisticated mm -hmm. uh, coin toss. Uh, uh, you, you toss a coin a thousand times in a second, and programmed, 
machine. Uh, if you keep doing it, you're going to get 50% heads, 50% tails. But when we come together and we, and we can actually execute, you have mm -hmm. 1,500 people or 2,500 people in a room, all of a sudden that random event generator becomes less random and more intentional. But the field actually changes as a result of collective networks of observers. So it's not the number of people and it's not the amount of energy that really matters. It's the most coherent signal that makes the biggest impact. It could be a smaller group, but more coherent that actually mm. can change um, can change the field. And, and we have data to suggest that people at a remote location that are somehow connected or entangled, actually their brains and hearts go into coherence when you do. So there's a, there's a good possibility for us to really, really uh, move the needle in a really healthy way. And as I said, something happened for me uh, at the end of our last event in Niagara Falls, just the last week, uh, at the end of that event, I just, I just am super optimistic that, that, uh, uh, we're, 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 we're making our way here. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And thank you for all the work that you do. You're so humble and, um, also so great and powerful. And I've been at your retreat and it's amazing to watch. And, um, you really, yeah. There's another additional energy that comes through you that really, really commands the space and helps educate people and people really get it. And that's why you're seeing it. So thank you for that. Ah, thank you for all the great work that you do also. I appreciate you. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, everybody, for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.